Hello, wraiths and waifus. My name is TV's Guy, And Riot, the bastard, had to go and unveil a whole new champion before I even got around to the last one that they released. But here we are, at last, to ask a question that I haven't asked in quite a long time, which is, what's the deal with Senna, the Redeemer? And yes, I do believe that the latter part of her title is supposed to be pronounced like that. The Redeemer. I don't think you're supposed to say it like you're introducing someone to your wife's friends, like at a party or something. Oh yeah, over there, yeah, yeah that's Senna. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, she's in the re redeeming business. She does a lot of redeeming. I don't know if she's like if she's redeeming souls or vouchers. Hey, honey, honey, does Senna redeem souls or vouchers? Souls. Okay, she yeah, she redeems souls. I believe that's a uh, part of the service industry. What? No, no, she's not single. Her husband is over there, Lucian. Yeah, he's a purifier. Anyway, moving on from my terrible sketch comedy, Senna may be the champion with, like, the longest teaser period of any champion in the game because she was technically, very technically teased with the release of Lucian back in, and I had to look this up, 2013, six years ago. Of course, when Senna was introduced, she wasn't so much a champion as she was, well, a fridged wife. Now, the fridged character is a trope in storytelling where one character is murdered or tortured or subjected to horrifying misery in order to act as a motivator for another. It comes from a Green Lantern storyline where Green Lantern returns home to his apartment to try and find his girlfriend only to realize that a supervillain has murdered her and stuffed her body in the fridge entirely to screw with him. Now, it doesn't necessarily refer to any character death that motivates someone else, but specifically character death and suffering that is only there to motivate a hero and really doesn't have anything to do with the victim of the violence. So, for example, in Batman's original origin story, his parents are fridged in order to provide motivation for the hero. Like, Batman stories are rarely really deeply concerned with the character and personality and the hopes and the dreams of Thomas and Martha Wayne, and a lot more concerned with how Batman is really, really sad that his parents are dead and now he's gonna punch some people about it. And Senna was very much that for Lucian back in 2013. She wasn't really a character so much as she was a prop that Lucian was chasing around and that acted as a character motivator. Now, as you can probably tell by the way I'm talking about it, a fridged character is often a point of criticism for storytelling. First of all, because it's a bit of an overused cliche, and second of all, because it can often be a very shallow way to provide motivation to a character. Like, it can often lead to storytelling where literally the only motivation a character has is that they're angry about the sad thing that happened, and if you took that away, there really wouldn't be any character left to work with because the story has been driven entirely by the extrinsic motivation of the dead person who must be avenged rather than any internal need that could provide a deeper characterization. And again, Lucian and Senna, very much that particular kind of character dynamic. If you took the fact that his wife is dead away from Lucian, there really wouldn't be much left. And if you took the fact that Senna is Lucian's dead wife away from her, there wouldn't really be any character there because being Lucian's dead wife was all that she had and all she was really about. So Senna is interesting in that she represents the rare unfridging of a wife, an attempt to take a very shallow characterization and begin to add some real depth to it. So how are they doing that with Senna? Well, let's dive into her lore and find out. Senna's journey to become a sentinel of light started with darkness. It started with the black mist. More specifically, some bits of a ghost ship washed up on the island where she lived, and some of the ghosts, like, cursed her or something, and then the Black Mist was just like, we're gonna screw up your entire life forever. To which Senna responds by being scared all the time and not having any friends in case the ghosts get them, which... Under the circumstances, is pretty reasonable. Fortunately, there is an order called the Sentinels, who are basically Ghostbusters. And one of those non-copyright infringing Ghostbusters is called Urias, who takes Senna under his wing and teaches her not to be scared of no ghost. Unfortunately, Senna is still traumatized by the whole being cursed by ghosts business, which, since they don't have therapists on Runeterra, is not a problem she can exactly solve. As a consequence, she becomes rather lonely and withdrawn, even from the other Sentinels, because, of course, like, she's always haunted by ghosts, so... Hanging out with her would never be relaxing, you'd be working all the time. And also, you know, possibly murdered by horrifying ghosts from beyond the Veil of Tears that have descended upon the mortal realm to consume the life of all living things in order to ease their own eternal suffering. And speaking of suffering, Senna is in for more of it because her mentor, Urias, dies, apparently murdered by the ghosts that are always haunting Senna. Senna goes to Demacia to inform Urias' family that 
she is the reason why he's dead, which I'm sure must have been awkward, and she runs into Lucian, who's Urias's son. Now, he was a boy, and she was a girl, who admittedly got the boy's father killed, but nonetheless, could I make it any more obvious? Lucian, as it turns out, before Senna got killed, had a very loving, kind, humorous personality that managed to break through Senna's many, 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 oh, truly so many emotional walls and worm his way into her heart. Unfortunately, stubborn, loving men have a habit of being stubborn, loving men all the time about everything, and while their partnership is a very happy one and Senna is very pleased to have a partner she can rely on, Lucian does become somewhat obsessed with curing Senna of her curse. And we're not told exactly what happened, only that Lucian becomes too stubborn to abandon a quest that might yield some answers, and in trying to protect her husband from Thresh, Senna is the one who's cut down instead. Fortunately, it turns out Senna's curse has an unusual quirk. As the Black Mist claims her soul, she finds that she's actually able to retain her personality and ride the mist into Thresh's lantern and see what's in there. Senna, as it turns out, was cursed not with undeath, but with an unusual spark of life. And life is the thing that the Black Mist hungers for more than anything else. And so, as far as I can make out, by having an extraordinary control over her life force, she's also able to wield a level of control over the Black Mist and even free other souls from its grasp. So she basically does that inside of the lantern for a long time, trying to free all the souls of other sentinels that Thresh has claimed, as well as anyone else she happens to stumble upon. Now, eventually, Lucian, being a stubborn, loving man to the last, decides that enough is enough. He's not going to try and kill Thresh anymore to avenge Senna. Instead, he's going to try and give her peace by destroying Thresh's Lantern. These, of course, are the events of the animated short that Riot released in order to show Senna's reveal. Basically, Lucian manages to break open the Lantern for a second, Senna manages to escape and takes all of the power and knowledge of the souls that she has freed with her. She basically manages to make herself a new body and a giant cannon from the souls of the Sentinels that she freed from the Lantern, and has decided to make it her personal crusade to put an end to the Black Mist specifically by putting an end to the ruined king who is still not alive as such, but who's certainly still active and doing something. You don't really know what, but something which is sinister and bad and stopping him is key to releasing all the trapped souls in the Black Mist. As for Lucian and Senna's relationship now that she's free, it's completely fine. There's no problems. There's no awkwardness or weirdness at all. Everything's totally cool. They're back to marital bliss, and they definitely don't have a whole bunch of deep-seated emotional issues that they need to work through, with Senna having spent years in a lantern being tortured by a malevolent wraith and Lucian torturing himself trying to free her. They are completely fine, and they definitely don't need therapy. Besides Senna's bio, she also has a short story called The Voices of the Dead, which... I have a number of criticisms of that will probably go in a separate video by themselves if I find the time to do it, but basically it describes Senna and Lucian answering a distress call, as it were, from another sentinel. They arrive at a village that is under assault by the Black Mist, and there fight a whole bunch of undead and find the spirit of the ruined king, who seems to be searching for something in the catacombs beneath the village, although we never learn what. They beat him back, they save the village, and in between that they have a slight few moments of awkwardness between them, where where it's like, yeah, okay, maybe they're not completely fine and maybe they do actually need just a little bit of relationship therapy. So, Senna is not especially well characterized in the lore that we have available, at least not in my opinion. We get much more of an insight into her personality and character from her voice lines and her special interactions, even though those are at best questionably canon. Still, the sense that you get from her voice lines and the way she interacts with the world is that she's someone who carries a lot of pain and trauma and the weight of a terrible burden and a task on her shoulders, but who pushes it all down and tries to cover it up with some lighthearted gallows humor. She also seems to have a relatively complicated emotional relationship with her husband, where she loves him very much, but he's also kind of frustrating to her because Lucian has a tendency to insist on wanting to protect and save her from everything. At first, it's from her curse, which of course is the thing that gets her killed by Thresh. Then he wants to save her from Thresh's lantern, and now that she's both alive and dead, Lucian is now running around with a whole bunch of survivor's guilt and a determination to find a cure for that as well. And that's a detail that I really like like about their relationship, that they love each other, but they also have, like, some complicated relationship problems because of all this shit that they've gone through. 
And while I really, 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 really wish that this stuff was better explored in the actual canonical lore material and not in the rather non-canonical voice lines, I'm glad that there seems to be a recognition there from Riot that the relationship between these two characters probably can't be uncomplicated and loving in the same way that, say, Saya and Rakan are. Anyway, with the lore out of the way, let's take a look at her character design and see if it measures up to what the story is trying to do. Now, the first thing about Sena's character design is that she is yet another hot League of Legends fantasy babe. Now, as I've talked about on this channel many times before, there's absolutely nothing wrong with having hot babes in your video game, but as character design, when you repeat that particular trope over and over and over and over and over again, it starts to become pretty boring, and in some cases, it can be actively detrimental to the storytelling of the character design itself. For example, say you had a woman who had spent the majority of her life since she was a child, bonded to an alien symbiote, and fighting a hostile encroaching force of extra-dimensional horrors that are attempting to consume her entire world forever, but then you gave her a character design like she's Scarlett Johansson doing a hot cosplay photoshoot for a Sports Illustrated Special Edition, it kind of becomes hard to buy her as a Rambo survivalist superhero fighting evil monsters in a corrupted hell dimension full of bloodthirsty monsters that corrupts everything it touches. Similarly, the story is eager to tell us that Senna has been haunted by the Shadow Isles and the most horrifying wraiths of the other world since she was a small child that she has lived her entire life pretty much on the run from ghosts that want to kill her. And then those ghosts succeeded in killing her and then she was trapped in a ghost lantern for like half a decade and then she was brought back to life as a sort of half-living, half-undead wraith person and yet she just kind of looks fine. Like, she looks like a normal human person with green glowing eyes who, like, occasionally has some smoke come off her. And even when she transforms into her wraith form, she isn't exactly turned into, like, an undead horror. She's just, like, a transparent version of herself. And that's sort of the trouble with just making her yet another hot fantasy babe, is that all these struggles that the story is telling us about, all this hardship, all this suffering, all this misery, none of it is really visually in evidence. And it's definitely true that in real life, you cannot tell who has been traumatized by what just by looking at them. Like, there's no way to look at a person and know their mental health or their mental state. But this is not real life. This is a visual medium, specifically it's a video game. And in storytelling, in general, the rule of thumb is show, don't tell. So when the story is trying to tell me that this character has had a really hard life and everything's been very, very tough on them, that they've gone through one hardship after the other, but the visuals aren't doing anything to show me that, that's a point of criticism. And you can definitely make up fan theories why Senna's character design might actually work if you think about it. For example, you could say that, ah, but Senna is a wraith who can control her physical and her ghost form, so she's choosing to appear like she's totally normal and everything's cool and none of her hardships are really showing because she's putting up a front of being okay, pretending to be fine, even though on the inside she's not really fine. And that's valid as an interpretation, I suppose, but when you have to make up extended fan theories in order to explain away flaws in the character design, my opinion is that the much simpler critical approach is to say, hey, maybe the simpler explanation here is that the character design just has some flaws. So for me, when I think about a character who is half alive and half undead and who's kind of trying to walk the razor thin line between those two worlds while also trying to balance their own trauma and determination, the obvious thing there is to have undeath show on her body in more physical ways. Like maybe have parts and patches of her where she can't quite maintain a human form and a wraith form kind of peeks through, like a patch of skin on her cheek that shows the skull underneath, or maybe have one hand be a skeleton hand or have her clothing be all torn and ragged like it's ancient and has been worn away by the ravages of time while she was trapped in Thresh's lantern. And talking of Thresh, hell, you could even have a big visible scar on her face or maybe on her midriff from where Thresh's hook killed her. Like, a visual representation of the wound that quite literally killed her would be a pretty natural thing to have on a character whose whole story is about dying and then coming back to life. Like, having a visual representation of the death they suffered is a pretty standard way to communicate that kind of story. And having her have visual scars and blemishes like a broken nose or a split lip or a missing finger would also be a visual indicator of the kind of life that she has led, always on the run from horrifying ghost monstrosities that want 
want to murder her. When we get the immaculate fantasy titty babe, like, that's cool, and that can be a very empowering fantasy, and that makes for some very appealing and often compelling character design, but in a lot of circumstances, like Kaisa, like Senna, it just doesn't make for very good storytelling. So, outside of those issues, there's a whole bunch of stuff to like about Senna. First of all, her giant ass cannon. How cool is that thing? Huge giant cannon weapons are just cool, and huge giant cannon weapons that are bigger than the person who's using it to shoot with are even cooler. This is a personal opinion of mine, but one that I suspect a lot of people will agree with. It also comes with a classic black and white split dichotomy, which kind of does a little bit of the storytelling for the character in that Senna too is split between the light and the dark. It's not subtle, but it works. Generally speaking, most of her character design is relatively understated. The big cannon takes up most of her silhouette, so there's a good reason to streamline the rest of the character model so as not to become too noisy or distracting. The major point of visual interest is her cloak, which billows around and does ghostly effects to kind of showcase that, hey, here's a champion who's a little bit ghost-like. And for the most part, that works fine. Her design also provides a nice contrast, but also a compliment to her husband, Lucian. She shares, generally speaking, the same color aesthetic, which is light and dark, with the white of her cloak contrasting nicely against the darker colors of her pants and chest plate. But unlike her husband, she has a lot more gold accents going on in her character design, which to me reads as kind of badges of honor or experience in the sense that she's a higher ranking member of the Sentinels and also that she has just like a lot more experience and knowledge than Lucian really does. Gold, of course, is also associated with power, and so it's very appropriate that the entire handle of her big-ass cannon is made of gold. All in all, from a character design perspective, I think Sen Senna is a perfectly B-plus effort that could have used a lot more visual storytelling to really hammer her themes home, but which otherwise works perfectly fine on a technical level. So, to finish us off, let's have a look at Senna's animation. In order to do that, I'm gonna have to throw it from me, relatively scripted, well-edited Sky, and over to somewhat less scripted and certainly not very well-edited Live Sky. And take it away, Live Sky. Well, thank you very much, pre-recorded Skyn. And yes, indeed, let's have a look at Sinez Animations, courtesy of the lovely model viewer by the people over at Teemo.gg. So, we're gonna, uh, like, like a lot of the more recent champions, unfortunately, a number of Sinez animations don't quite work with the model viewer. They, in fact, break it quite terribly. So we can't look at everything, but we'll look at a few of the more interesting ones, starting with her absolutely amazing idle animation. Now you can probably <laughs> you can probably see uh, that something screwy is going on here, and it only becomes more obvious when we slow the whole thing down. Senna's upper body massively elongates; her neck <laughs> gets completely, I think, even almost like disconnected from her collarbone, and extends straight up in a breathing idling animation. Now. When we're looking at it like this, it obviously looks quite horrifying and bad, but of course, what you must remember is that in League of Legends, you tend to view characters like this. And so if you want to do a breathing animation, like a, a, a slow bobbing up and down, a rising and falling of the chest in times with the breathing of the character, you can't do it subtly. Like you can't just do like a little, it has to be a, like a real big movement so that we get the full movement of the entire character so that it's readable from distances like this. And as always, that does lead to a little bit of incidental weirdness when you come in close and see exactly what's happening to this poor woman's ribcage. The other thing I want to focus on, though, is something that is all over Senna's animations and one of the best parts of the way that our character model is animated, and that is the weight of the gun. So take a look at how the gun moves, right? So we we start here at her, she settles into her resting pose before she takes another breath in, right, and rises up again. And look at how Senna herself settles in her resting pose there, but the gun, you can see how it keeps moving a little bit. And as she rises, look at this, as her chest rises, look at how this corner of the gun basically doesn't move until there. It starts to rise, and then it hits the peak around here, and then you can see this corner of the gun practically doesn't move, 
until it's time for her to descend again. Take a look at how the corners of the gun kind of stay stationary up and down. So you get this kind of waggling motion of the gun where the, the front part layer with a handle isn't moving at exactly the same rate as the rest of the gun. So you get this slight little tiny seesawing effect where each side of the gun isn't going up and down at the same rate. And that gives you that 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 sense of weight rising and falling and rising and settling. And that's something that's in evidence pretty much all over um, Sena's animations is everything she does has some kind of weight relationship with her gun, which makes sense because this thing is massive and it's clearly made of solid stone or something. So it only makes sense that Sena would need to accommodate its weight when she moves. Now here again, um, we can see some rather um, exaggerated stretching going on like look look at her torso how it how it stretches and moves um with th this bobbing walk cycle and that's the same principle as with the breathing is that when you're viewing the character from this far away the bobbing needs to read like it needs to be visible it needs to be obvious that this bobbing up and down motion is happening and if you try to do it too subtly from this distance and especially in the hecticness of a game like league of legends you just can't tell that it's happening now one thing about Sinna's character model that uh it's not really evidence in her splash art, but which is certainly in evidence in the way her character is modeled is... <sighs> That's quite a lot of booty that they gave her, and I got I, I wasn't gonna talk about it, but the more I looked at her animations, the more I was like, someone at Riot had a really good day <laughs> creating Senna's character model, because this freaking thing, like... Look at those hips wiggling, even to the point where you can see it deforms her entire spine. This is like, this is worse than DJ Sona. I mean, honestly, Riot, come now. They're sexualizing a character and then there's being this. Like, this <laughs> freaking horny animators, goddamn. I don't mind it. Like, that's, yeah, yeah, that's, like, again, not something you're ever gonna see from, like, up here, but that <laughs> just. <laughs> It's just so, like, the texturing, like, look at the texturing on this, like, the, the highlights and, like, how every buttock is, like, lovingly carved out of the back of the character. Uh, it's ridiculous. Anyway, uh, that's not really what I wanted to talk about. What I wanted to talk about, again, is the gun. Notice how the gun moves relative to the body. That's actually probably easier to see from here. You see that swaying back and forth? Like, as she, as she lands on her right leg here, boom, the gun starts swaying to the right. And as she lands on her left leg here, you can see how the gun sways to the left. So the gun follows the rhythm of her walking as it has this, this swaying back and forth that happens. But again, you can see how the things, things are a little bit offset. Like, she, it doesn't move at exactly the same uh, rhythm than she, that she does, it just it moves at the same pace, but not at exactly the same beat. And so you get this offset feeling between like Senna's movements and the gun's movements, which again help communicate the weight of the thing. And another little tiny detail that I really love is this, that little clapper there, whatever the heck that is, like that, it's a lock or something? You see that little bounce it gets? Little boink, 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 up and down. That's, again, that's that's a slightly odd detail because that's not really something that you're going to notice very much from this distance, but it just adds a little bit extra flair to the proceedings. I also do like the trailing of her whatever the heck this is. It must be very inconvenient. Um, and the little bob of her hair as well. Like, it, it all adds a sense of secondary motion. The secondary motion is stuff like the bobbing of the hair and, like, the, the, the flailing of this little trailing thing here and this little thing bobbing up and down. Those secondary motions kind of add a lot of character to how, the, how, how, how a character moves in space. And that's something that's in evidence here, which I quite like. Now, let me see... I think spell one breaks the character model viewer, so we're not going to do that one. But is that... Yeah, that one's not working quite correctly. Uh, can I do spell two? I think spell two works. If I can... Spell two works and spell four doesn't. Yeah, there's some there's some squ uh, squirreliness. You can see this doesn't work quite well either. The recall animation is entirely busted. And one of the worst things um, about the model viewer is unfortunately has a lot of trouble rendering particle effects. And here, like that, like look at that. <laughs> Those fucking buttocks, man. 
Uh, and, and like, again, in game, you're not going to see this because in game she has the cloak that floats over her body. So th I think this is just like something the animator did for fun. Um, let me see. There's the dance loop. We get a little bit from that. But I, what I really want is to see if I can get an attack. I think attack one works. Yeah, attack one works. There we go. Because here we get to see some really fucking cool animation on the gun. So take a look. This is Senna winding up for a basic attack. She thrusts the gun forward. And the whole front part of it just comes out and floats. And then we get this cool ass thing. Like, look at that cool shit. Boom. You can see uh, that's, uh, of course, this is accompanied with a bunch of particle effects showing the gun charging up power as she's getting ready to fire with each shard of the gun kind of flipping out like this, which is just the fucking cool. Like, you really get the sense of the tension building up in the thing as we get to the actual firing, which looks like that. And here's where you can do something really cool with these shards. Like, we talk often when we deal with animation of, of deformation of characters and um, squash and stretch, which is a very useful principle for communicating this kind of motion. And you can really see it here. Like, how Senna's entire model basically turns into spaghetti for a second there, boing, as she deals with the recoil from the gunshot. But even more than that, Take a look at what happens to the gun itself when this when the shot goes off. You see that? You see how that like that that middle part of the rally gun kind of bulges out and the whole thing does this kind of looney tunes boing thing. And all of that is in service of just selling the power of the hit. And that's why those shards are really really fucking clever because since they can be moved individually and this is really hard to see but see how the animator like, they even let them clip into each other. That doesn't really matter, because you're not going to see it, because the motion is so quick. But you get this wonderful liquid, rubbery motion out of the gun that really sells the power of the shot that she's about to deliver. Let's see if we can get attack two to do something for us. Yeah, there we go. And that leads into her secondary um, attack animation pose. This is something I really like about modern League of Legends champions, by the way, is that they have... At, at first, first, they do one basic attack that leaves them in one key pose, and then they move from that key pose into a different secondary attack animation, and maybe a third, and then back to the first one. So you have this loop of different attack animations that lead into each other. Um... And sort of that's that sort of create a full combo, and that it just I just think that's really fucking cool. And again, here you can see as she gets ready to fire the gun sideways, the boing, that same Looney Tunes cartoony effect happens again. And you can really like when when we zoom in here, you can really see how much they break the character model to make this work. Like, look where her head is. Look what how her body is contorted. Look at those fucking ass cheeks. God damn it how much her body contorts in order to sell the motion. And it looks completely ridiculous again, up close. But from out here, it makes the whole motion work really, really well. Let's see, what else did I want? I wanted her run. Where the hell is her run? There it is. Here's a lovely run cycle. I can't show you her home guard animation, even though it's really, really cool because it breaks the model viewer. But take a look at the weight of the gun. Again, look how the gun is kind of offset. Like, it's moving at the same rhythm, like the same speed as Senna is, like, uh, but it's offset. It doesn't, like, her, when, when her foot lands there, the gun keeps going. And you can see how it's constantly kind of... She reaches the, uh, like, when she jumps from her, she, she's got about to jump with her left, or with her right leg here, right? And she reaches the peak of that jump about here. Like, that's as high as she goes. But the gun keeps moving, and then when she comes down, like, she has already landed here. But look how the gun kind of, it's constantly following behind her up and down bob, right? It's constantly following a little bit behind her, which again gives you that sense of weight that there's a lot of inertia here that she has to move around in order to get going. And you can also kind of see that just in the way that she runs. She has this kind of hunched over forwards thing with this giant weight hanging down off the front of her that she's constantly kind of uh, hoisting up a little bit as she's running. Uh, let's see... She also has a whole bunch of run variation. And again, those fucking ass cheeks. Like, god damn it. These are so stylized and exaggerated. It's ridiculous. But here again, here's a lovely uh, showing of, like, this is this is her run to... This is one of her transitional animations. Like, this is when she's in her run, and I think she stops. 
and just like stand still. Look what the gun does. As she swings it from here, where you can see, again, because we're not looking too closely at the animations, we can just have them clip into things completely awkwardly. But look what happens here. The whole gun, as she swings it around in a quick motion to kind of get into that position, the whole gun kind of splits apart into its individual shards. And then as she finishes the sweep, they settle back into their original configuration, which I just think is such a cool little flourish. And you can see it again here as she hoists the gun up quickly. They all kind of mag magnetically stick together and kind of follow it up. And then again here, she swings the gun around again in order, I guess, to go back into her run animation. You can see it again, how the gun, like it's almost being treated like a liquid, right? Like it's it's almost behaving a little bit like these shards are suspended in liquid or held together with jello or something. Which is such a lovely way to show the weight. And you can also see like how Senna handles the weight. Look at this. She raises the gun up. Like she, she does this quick motion to raise the gun up, right? And then at the uh, here's the peak of the gun's velocity. She's just given it velocity up. Now it's about to get velocity down. Woof. You can see how the whole weight of the gun just pulls her into this crouch. And that's what I really like about Senna's animation in particular, is that there's so much attention paid to respecting the weight of the gun. And that's something that's actually kind of important for her in-game communication. That gun is powerful, and it needs to read as powerful. We need to understand it as powerful in order to, like, in, or in order to have a, a correct understanding of who she is as a character and what she can do. So, if the gun looked really light, like if it would look like it was made of plastic or something because it just moved too easily, it followed her movements too closely without really, like, uh, without really respecting her momentum, that would kind of suck. Like, that, that would make the gun less um, believable. Like, that would make it less believable that this thing is thrumming with arcane power or whatever. I mean, I mean, like, look at that waist. Like, someone in the Riot modeling department has too much fun that day. Anyway, that was a look at Senna's animations. I don't want this to go too far over 15 minutes. And I'm going to throw it back to pre-recorded Skyne, who's going to take you out of the video. Well, thank you very much, Live Skyne, and thank you very much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please feel free to hit the like, comment, and subscribe buttons down below. Those buttons help out YouTubers a lot, which is why we keep asking you to click on them, because YouTube just wants the numbers to go up, and if the numbers don't go up, then you don't get to be a YouTuber. If you would like to support the channel more directly, then my Patreon and my tip jars are available down in the description. And I would like to thank Nathan Russell, Matthias Contreras, I think that's how you're supposed to pronounce that, Sator Appetite, Felicia Rosenberg, Alexei, Mihai Chis, Ashley, The Boy, A13X07, Marco Denique, Shirley Neko, Kawaii Osaurus, and Megan for their pledges to the Patreon this month. Your names will be added to the Patreon crawl at the beginning of December. Now, if you don't want to support me directly, that is, of course, completely okay. The only thing I'll say is that for online content creators, those $1 donations, those tiny little pledges that you get on your Patreons, they can mean the same as literally thousands of views on a video. So if there is an online content creator whose work you enjoy, and especially if they're smaller creators or just starting out, consider supporting them whenever you can with whatever you can, because even those small donations that don't really feel like they should matter very much can actually matter a great deal. Now, if you haven't enjoyed this video, fortunately, right below this video, there's a dislike button for you to click on. It's a little bit weird, because I found that dislike button on my page one day, and I don't think I know exactly where it came from. And I've tried, I've tried to throw it out, and I've tried to get rid of it, and I've tried to even give it away once I got so desperate that I even tried to burn it, but no matter what I do, every night I go to bed, and when I wake up, that dislike button is right back where I left it. In the end, I got so desperate that I went to a spirit medium, of all things, to try and help me solve this, but she took one look at the button and just screamed and ran away and begged me not to make her touch it. To this day, I don't know what that means, but anyway, if you haven't enjoyed this video, you can just click it and I'm sure it'll be fine.